introduce our guest speaker. Over to you, Michaela. Well, everybody, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Sarah Meredith as our speaker this evening. Sarah is the Australian Country Director of Global Citizen. She is a passionate advocate for gender equality, for investment in universal health care, in access to clean water, and she's very committed to Australia's role and delivery of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, Sarah comes to this role with more than 13 years experience in public policy. So she has advised not only federal and state ministers, but also the federal cabinet on matters as diverse as the environment, water, climate change, youth affairs, education and training, drug and alcohol, and also mental health reform. Sarah has been an active member of the community for a very, very long time. And indeed in 2001, as part of the Australia Day Honours, she was named the City of Casey's Citizen of the Year. Now, she has represented Australia in a number of forums, and indeed, in that, which included the Young People Can Change the World Youth Forum in Wales in 2001. Sarah sits on a number of boards, including Melbourne's bid for the 2022 Women Deliver Conference, and also Netball Australia's World Cup bid. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Meredith. Three. Thanks so much, Michaela, for that really warm introduction. And um, I really want to thank you for your generosity and true Rotarian spirit in uh, welcoming me, um, but also encouraging me to participate and get involved in Rotary. Um, it's a huge year for Rotary with the 100th anniversary. And it's, um, I want to pass on my congratulations to the club and, and all the clubs across the country for the incredible work that Rotary does in our community. Um, I'm very honoured to be invited to speak uh, tonight. Uh, I am a Melbourneian, um, born and raised, so I'm very proud to be speaking to the Rotary Club of Melbourne. But what I thought I would do is step you through um, who is Global Citizen, the mission to end extreme poverty, can we end extreme poverty by 2030, um, the impacts of COVID-19, and hopefully leave you um, with a bit of hope by the end of this presentation about what we can all do as individuals, um, but also what our governments, philanthropists, corporates can do to end extreme poverty. So Global Citizen um, is really an Australian story. It's something that we're all very proud of, founded by a couple of Aussies here in Melbourne. Um, it was originally called Global Poverty Project and was formed over 10 years ago. Global Citizen has um, grown into the, the world's largest movement towards ending extreme poverty. And when we talk about ending extreme poverty, it's a very complex challenging challenge and something that people feel really overwhelmed about. But what we know, what we try to do at Global Citizen is to break that down into small chunks of actions that people can take, but also provide the education and resources people need to find out more information and then also speak to their friends about it. A Global Citizen uses a number of tools, which I'm looking forward to talking to you about to to use as an advocacy platform and, and help us in our effort to end extreme poverty. The reason we do everything really drives our work. We're mission focused organisation, and that is to build a movement of 100 million action taking global citizens to help our G achieve a vision of ending extreme poverty by 2030. We know the mission to end extreme poverty is a huge challenge. What I think is the most hopeful part of this mission is that over the last 30 years, we've seen poverty halved. And that uh, currently it's over 700 million people living in, in extreme poverty. That's people living on less than $1.90 a day. In that context, but that's a pretty phenomenal story. Uh, for me, that shows that we can through policy changes and through government changes and, and implementation of legislative change, really see that 
that shift in the number of people living in extreme poverty. There is hope. But what we've been seeing in the numbers over the last two years is that whilst overall the number of people living in extreme poverty is halved, the people living in the 59 poorest countries, poverty is actually rising. And of those countries, Nigeria is one of the largest populations where it is seeing rapid rise in people living in extreme poverty. In our region, Papua New Guinea is one of those countries that we need to keep our eye on. And it's been so important and I think really positive that the Australian government has prioritised our effort through the Australian aid budget um, in Papua New Guinea and the Pacific nations, because if we are to see an end in extreme poverty, it's not just in, in the large continents like Africa that we need to see change, it's also in the small island nations that are in our region. We are, we've been working with a number of partners to, to really quantify what is the gap to end extreme poverty. And, in, and at the end of last year, the figure of 350 billion annually is the gap that we see to ending extreme poverty. A large part of that traditionally has been through overseas development assistance or international aid, foreign aid, as many people call it. Um, but what we think is the next wave of the opportunity to end extreme poverty is philanthropy, the private sector, looking at institutional investors, how to social impact investing, um, can, how can that be a piece in the puzzle? Also seeing current wealthy countries, and, and this is where it's gonna be very difficult over the coming years, um, committing further funding in overseas development assistance. And then looking at the countries themselves that's the domestic government spending. Can we see those governments better spend that money and it be better targeted? For example, it could be 15% of domestic budgets being put towards health and making that health strengthening fundamental to the aid that's provided. So when a pandemic hits, the 59 poorest countries, but also you know, the entire globe is able to put in place the measures that are needed. So for us, this big figure was what we were focusing our campaign off efforts on this year and as we kick into the decade of action to the 2030 agenda. And I have a little bit more to say about that challenge later. Um, but as I mentioned, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, every I've done a Master of International and Community Development and spent a lot of time trying to study how do we solve this development problem? How do we measure and how do we know? And, and 193 countries have signed on to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They are the best metrics that we have to determine how we're progressing. And so at Global Citizen, we campaign on these goals. We campaign to make sure the world knows about them, um, that we're holding governments and policymakers to account on the delivery of those goals, and that we look to provide content and storytelling pieces so that um, you know, we, we all understand why zero hunger is important, why quality education, why gender equality and clean water and san sanitation are all foundational to a better world. There's a great, um, I just thought I'd, I'd put this up. This is a great um, tool to really understand how we're tracking with those goals. And it's called the Sustainable Development Report. And I put the link at the top there and happy to email it. But you can go to each of those goals and see how each country is tracking. And it's surprising on some indicators, for example, food and nutrition, even Australia has a way to go because of also our obesity challenges. So I think it's really interesting to see how we move the dial in each of these goals and, and it's currently being reported live. So there's lots of opportunity to see uh, how far away are we? And in, say, for example, in Papua New Guinea, how, how much further we need to go. I thought I'd um, just play one video and I hope it works. Really, I, I want to press upon you how important that we've gone halfway, but we still have a way to go. And I hope this inspires you a little bit.
Usain Bolt has stopped! Usain Bolt has stopped at the 50 meter line! Oh, that is a pity! Fire. Follow your on course, 226 hours to the moon orbit. Okay, thanks, Houston. But I think we'll be heading back now. Tell me, Gap? Yeah, it was kind of fun. But I think halfway will do. Job done. <laughs> So as you'll see from that video, uh, I'll just make sure, I'm, yep. Um, you'll see that we love to tell stories and that's kind of foundational to who we are at Global Citizen. It's so important that we, um, I'll just make sure it's worked properly, sorry. Is my screen? Yep, no, you're good. Okay. Sorry, um, the global goals are really important to us and to tell those stories and people move to take action. Um, really how our model works and, and Michaela really um, told that story well is we use festivals and major events to put poverty on the agenda. So one of our biggest events uh, in the annual calendar is a, a festival, 60,000 people in New York Central Park. They have all taken action to secure their ticket. The tickets are free. So the only way you can t uh, get a ticket is by signing a petition. Um, it might be sending a tweet to a world leader, sending an email, sharing a content piece amongst your friends. You earn those points and you go into a ballot to win a ticket. And the way we can do those major festivals is through incredible support from global artists, um, both sporting, music. Uh, there are many individuals that come on our stage to support the mission. Um, we also have incredible speakers and have had many world leaders come on our stage. We have millions of people taking action to be part of these events. And then we also partner with many brands and, and corporate leaders because as I mentioned to you earlier if we're going to end extreme poverty it's not governments it's not corporates it's not philanthropists or individuals we all have to come together and our model is essentially a partnership model that we bring in every possible player to the discussion to these key moments both online now we we had two major broadcast events and you may have seen one world together at home which we launched at the start of the covid campaign with lady gaga and then more recently global goal unite which also was broadcast on channel nine these events are, are really fun. Um, we, we don't, we, we try to bring fun, inspiration, excitement to the, the campaign to end extreme poverty. It can be quite hopeless. You feel like there's no hope at some points, but we know there is hope and we want to make sure we put that front and centre. We are driven by impact. We're independently audited. We have partners such as PwC that come in and track every conversation every element of the commitment process and to date our events over the last 10 years the commitment through our processes has raised 48.4 billion dollars towards ending extreme poverty and there is a result of 25 million actions by people across the globe for us uh, in in the australian team 
we're really focused on what's Australia's role in the world. But we know this year was supposed to be 10 years to go to the 2030 agenda. Um, and we had planned at the start of the year to do a major music festival in September 2020, which would see um, at one, it would be the next Live Aid at the same time, more than across five continents that we would have events. Um, and so for us, we still want to push that agenda and we're going to focus on 2021. But what I think is really important is, is to acknowledge the significant impact of COVID-19 that it will see more people lifted into extreme poverty than ever before. Um, I just thought I'd highlight to you that Australia does have a huge opportunity and I know there's significant economic impacts of COVID-19, but at the, we are at the lowest level of giving that we have ever been. And, and this top chart on the left, generosity of aid as a percentage of GNI is what we track as development practitioners of the richest countries giving, and Australia has slowly dropped to 0.19%, $4 billion annually. And a lot of people in it, and there's been surveys, a lot of Australians believe we give much more than we do. They often believe we give for 10% of the global, of the Australian federal budget. But I put a little graph on this, on the right hand side, that actually aid is only 0.82% of the Australian budget we have the opportunity to lift even to 1% of our budget. The, the government is committed to defence spending to be 2%. Two, two and I would argue personally that for the stability of our region, for peace and prosperity, for to represent Australian values, that we should have a strong aid budget, just as strong as our defence budget, because they go hand in hand. And so from my perspective, I wanted to get across today that if we're to end extreme poverty, our governments also need to show leadership and Australia has a critical role in that. This year for our team, um, we've loved partnering with Rotary uh, on the End Polio campaign. I just thought I'd share this photo from World Pol uh, Polio Day last year in Canberra. We partnered with UNICEF Australia, with Results Australia, Rotary, Polio Australia, to hold an event to really hold our, to call upon our government to make sure that it continues to make a contribution to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, that Australia is a leader on the global stage to make the priority and investment of the polio program um, critical in the budgets ahead. And what we know, and I think what is most worrying is Pakistan was going backwards last year due to a number of on ground issues and getting the vaccine out there and the poly uh, and the COVID outbreak has only made it worse. And so we know that there'll be much needed money by the end of the year. And we'd love to work with Rotary groups on trying to get our government to make a new commitment to that once we know what the ask is. And, and I guess from our perspective, if we don't vocalize and, and continue to put pressure on governments of what are the programs we wanna see win in this process, uh, you know, it'll be hard to prioritise these really critical programs. The mission to end extreme poverty is very complex and unfortunately we are gonna be set back due to COVID-19, but I think it presents a really exciting opportunity for us to look at how do we spend our money and how important is global health investment? Because a pandemic is, as we know, very, um, much a threat on the horizon. This isn't the final pandemic that, that's going to come our way. So governments need to be forward thinking. They need to be ensuring that all countries have health strengthening, that we support those most in need, and that we have critical investment in vaccines and um, making sure that our community understands the importance of vaccines. The World Health Organization last year said one of the greatest threats to our global health security um, was vaccine hesitancy. And I think here in Australia, we've had a government that's made vaccines a priority and through the no jab, no play, the no jab, no pay policies, it's really meant that our community understands how important vaccines are, but that's not the case in many countries across the globe where we need to make sure that herd immunity is high and vaccines are critical. So hopefully I've given you a snapshot. I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Um, I do have some data that would hopefully 
be useful if you do have some more complex questions. So Sarah, as always, I mean, I'm just delighted. This is just amazing, the stuff you've presented to us. Um, we'd just like to throw, to, 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 to wrap a bow around this, is to show that beautiful video that you had sent us earlier. And I might uh, Fabulous. ask <laughs> to show that. It's a very uplifting way just to wrap your presentation. So perhaps, Mark, if we could throw to you. You ever wonder what 60,000 people trying to change the world sounds like? Hello, global citizen! The next year and a half will shape the future of humanity and our planet. Progress we need will only be possible if folks like you continue to take action. Are you with us? Together we can achieve a world where she is equal. The climate youth movement is more important than at any time in human history. And speaking of Mother Earth, let's rock it! Education is the key to unlocking a better world for all of us. Future generations deserve a world free from AIDS, TB, and malaria, and we can make that happen. Are you with us? <laughs> well, if uh, what, a, what a wonderful way to finish. Um, so what we um, normally uh, will do now uh, is uh, open the floor to questions. And in this Zoom environment, the way that we'll facilitate it is that I'll call on particular uh, club members who have put a question to us. So uh, Jim Orchard had a question. We might throw to Jim and perhaps Jim, if you could ask uh, Sarah uh, your question. Sure, uh, thanks Sarah. That was a, a great, great presentation. Um, and, and I guess not, notwithstanding the, the work that still needs to be done, it's, it's great to see such uh, progress has been made over the last, I guess, 20 years, which your graph showed. Would you be able to sort of share some insights as to what have been the key factors in driving such impressive um, reduction in extreme poverty over the, the last 20 years? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think there's a number of factors. The first is obviously that that China, the changes in population and economy in China has seen significant number of people lifted out of poverty in that country. But more importantly, I think it's been the global cooperation, the systems that have developed over the last 30 years that has seen a more targeted approach, countries coming together. The, you know, for, I look at the polio program and that has been a global effort to ensure vaccines receive, uh, are sent to every corner of the earth. Um, that has been, I think, the most exceptional example. There, it, there are programs where there have been challenges and I know hunger the end hunger movement, a number of programs in Africa, there've been successes, um, but also, you know, we're now in a situation where they're, the numbers are increasing and the number of people are starving in African countries. So, you know, I think there's many, many lessons to learn. I think for me, if I could pinpoint one thing that has been successful, I would say it's global cooperation and um, the programs and investments that the governments have made have vastly improved. You know, we're in such a modern world now. I don't know if many of you have watched the documentary Bill's Brain, um, but there's a great um, episode there where they talk about the technology improvements to pinpointing where the gaps are in the the polio vaccine delivery, but also there's an episode talking about water and sanitation um, technologies. And we know um, in 2016, we went to Mumbai, India and, and took our festival there. And what the biggest challenge in, in India is, is the open defecation. And, and a large part of that is not the investment in infrastructure. It's the education programs of um, why it's important not to defecate in the open and why toilet facilities are important, why we need sanitation programs. So for us, 
it's about education, it's, it's about the money on the ground. It's also about changing government practices. Um, I, know, I know that I myself have had concerns about corruption and government accountability for many developing countries. And I think that's something that we work to try and change through our platform because, you know, they need a leadership position as well. There are countries that want to create change. So we try to work with the countries that need to change their practices, need to improve their budgets, need to improve their spending, as well as the donor countries changing how they hold those countries accountable and how they give the dollars. Uh, there's a question. Uh, thank you, um, Sarah. There's a question from our president. Um, okay. McLeod. Thank you, Sarah. That was uplifting. Love the videos. Um, <laughs> just in terms of how COVID-19 is going to impact your actual events. And in particular, um, I think everybody is getting, is, is starting to look inwards, especially in their, their own localities and their own communities and thinking about mental health. And I know that, you know, in Rotary, we've been very focused on, on trying to support the, the bushfire affected areas, which were um, kind of forgotten when COVID first started. How do you see that impacting on what you're trying to do and trying to get people to look at being global citizens when all over the world, because the pandemic has hit everybody, um, everybody is kind of going inward looking? Mm. What's your view? You know, it's, um, it's interesting for us because we've always been a global online community. So we've always interacted with our global citizens through globalcitizen.org, through the emails we send on our social platforms. But then we've had this incredible in-person music festival environment where people have felt this electric feeling and, and real purpose in what we do. Um, but I think for us, the real pivot happened uh, in April when what was, would have been the end of March, early April, when the pandemic first hit, hit and people were wanting to, we needed to encourage people to stay home. And for us, that really presented a unique opportunity. Dr. Tedros of the World Health Organization spoke to our CEO, Hugh Evans, and, and really wanted to have us come on board to try and get young people part of the solution and staying home and encouraging them to to support neighbours and, and their local communities in that. And I think it was kind of incredible to see us lift as an organisation. We started, uh, Chris Martin of Coldplay came on board and did his first at-home session, which was called Together at Home. And then that kicked off a series of artists doing those on Instagram Live. And we had, you know, thousands of people watching them live and being part of this um, movement that we didn't even know was really going to start to grow the way it did. And then um, the next step really was when Lady Gaga said she wanted to come on board and be part of a, a global broadcast moment. And within three weeks, we put on a worldwide broadcast um, and it was aired here on Channel uh, 7 and it was also on Channel 10 live commercial free, all the broadcasters across the globe gave up precious airtime to, to put this one moment together. And for us, that was, um, I guess, the first opportunity to see how we could move this face live event, face-to-face -face live event of music festivals to a broadcast event. And we learned that you can do that as well. And people are engaged and they want to be part of something bigger than what they're already, bigger than their world. And I think for me personally as well, um, at that time, it was really isolating. For many of us younger people, this was the first time we face such an extraordinary world event. Um, and to feel that isolation and that feeling that everything's happening online and you, you want to be part of something, but you're at home and, and you don't really know what's next. Um, I hope through our platform we gave young people but also the broader community a feeling of hope that there is, um, we are going to get through this pandemic. When you look at history and how we've handled health responses like the polio program, like measles, there are a number of diseases that we will find a way through and, we, we, and only if we do it together will we get to the end. I think for the music industry, this disease has been 
this pandemic has been disastrous. You know, it's seen the end of live music and it's been incredible to see artists give their time, try and um, bring that a hope and inspiration to many people through live music events, through many social platforms. So I think um, from that perspective, we're kind of in a new, a new environment for how we do business and how we do campaigning and advocacy. Oh, marvellous. Um, Reg, can I ask, uh, you've got a question, uh, Reg Smith? Um, I'm not sure if our technology is helping us here. The booth <laughs> operator doesn't know how to unmute. That's a bit of a commentary, commentary isn't it? Um, no, that's all right. There you go. Uh, great presentation, Sarah. Thanks very much. And you conquered the technology beautifully. Much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you, Reg. Um, the, the question I had is really uh, just from your experience in this charity uh, over uh, many years, I'm interested in how you, what, what you regard as the most effective ways to engage young people in uh, the uh, sustainability issues, the global citizenship issues, I guess, uh, how they can become better, um, you know, aspire to be global citizens, particularly in a time I might say when uh, we're being encouraged to think more locally and nationally. Yeah. I mean, I would say authenticity is one of the most important principles that you're dealing, we are a generation that has extraordinary access to information. And I, don't, I know I see with my nieces and nephews now that they're on YouTube and able to research. They're looking through their social media and they're getting all these facts and figures and quite across a lot of information. They know how to test your information as well. So when you put out something on social media or when you're telling a story, you need to be direct, um, honest and, and really come at a facts-based approach. And so with us, it's really important and, and, we often talk about it is reporting impact. If we ask you to tweet a world leader to call for them to make a new commitment to education, we're going to report back to you on what happened with that call to action. And we're going to keep tracking it over a number of years to see that that commitment is delivered because we know there's a lot of scepticism in the community and for young people particularly, um, we think that's high. So from my perspective, I think it's really authentic focus on impact um, and really look at connection, connection to the story, the why behind the work that you do. And I think this is one thing that Rotary has done really well um, from an outside point of view is telling those stories of why you focus on the volunteering or why you're giving money to particular causes. Um, tell that story, then report on the impact of why you gave that money. So, you know, if, if, there was a project in the region that you gave money to and then report how that's progressing and the update. And if Rotarians are going to visit that project, um, what was that experience like for them? Because I think that authenticity is what really has the impact. Um, thank you, uh, Sarah. Peter Berg has a question. I think you might still be muted, Peter. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Okay, good. It took a little while to come up, actually. Sorry about that. Look, thank you very much, um, Sarah. Um, my question is um, around uh, the fact that Rotary has just announced the environment as its seventh area of focus, uh, which means that Rotary's seven areas of focus now cover all of the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And my question is, could you comment further on the linkage between climate change and poverty? Absolutely. I think, you know, the challenge ahead for us is how are governments going to respond in the next Paris Agreement to the global climate problem? Because it can't be individual countries going it alone. We know that the changing environment affects food systems, it affects 
um, households, you know, in the Pacific, rising sea levels is going to be a huge issue. We're going to see an increase in natural disasters. We know that malnutrition in our region is one of the biggest challenges. Um, changing food systems is going to cause havoc. So we need to be prepared. How do we make sure that farmers have the current information and the best technology to change how they, the practices of um, their farming techniques. And we know in Australia, a lot of farmers are already doing this. They're changing how they care for the soil, the soil techniques, you know, around no-till farming. Um, and that's going to be critical as we move to the next decade. But, you know, we know that the climate is a bigger problem that it's a higher issue on the agenda that needs to be, you know, made a priority by our political leaders. Unfortunately, with COVID, this year was going to be that conversation internationally um, and that will be moved to next year. So I think Rotary has a real opportunity to, to look at that individual side of the environment. You know, how do we, um, what about our waste? How do we use energy? What is our individual footprints? How do we contribute as community groups? Do we work on our local environmental systems? We know that every waterway links um, to improving the broader ecological system. So um, I would argue strongly that we should all be quite concerned about our own environmental footprint, what our local governments are doing, what our state governments are doing. But then our federal government has a real leadership role here. Um, you know, I, I have been involved in environment environmental policy for over a decade. I think the incredible work of organisations like Land Care, Conservation Volunteers Australia, Greening Australia, the many organisations that are purchasing properties to make sure we have a national reserve system. All of these organisations are working towards clean air to making sure that we have great farming practices. And I think those little practical pieces that every individual can be part of, they can volunteer their time, community groups can be part of, have a huge impact on the national and global stages. Um, but it is true that the global policies where every country is working to reduce their emissions is absolutely critical. Um, the politics of that is really hard to navigate. <laughs> um, and you know, when it comes to countries like ours where the politics has been really politicised on political parties, that creates a problem because the environment is above that and it shouldn't be down to political parties dictating, you know, you're not a greenie or a member of the Greens party if you care about the environment, we all should. Um, and now I think that's been a concerning part of this political movement. And I think everyone should have that voice and be part of any political movement they want to. I'm not saying don't be, but what I'm saying is, the environment has been turned into this left-right battle when it really should be common sense that if, if your waterways are dirty, if your waste is sinking into these mass landfills creating significant emissions, you've got a problem. Yeah. And we've all got to work to try and find a solution. Yeah, well said, Sarah, well said. Um, Robert Fisher, uh, you've got a question. You might just... Uh, Thank you, Michaela, and thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. Um, I understand your comment earlier about the need for broad cooperation across all sectors of society. And I hope this is not a, a trite question, but I, I, I have read somewhere that if the, uh, the, the wealthiest people in the US were to club together, uh, in the stroke of a pen, they could end world poverty, at least in the short term, without seriously diminishing their own wealth. And I'm wondering if the Global Citizen as an organization has thought to take up this kind of principle and make direct um, approaches to, to these extraordinarily wealthy people. That's a great question, and absolutely. So it was part of what I um, talked about earlier, which was uh, an, an event we were doing in September called Global Goal Live, The Possible Dream. The idea was that we were going to try and reach this 350 billion figure, um, not alone. Obviously, that's the UN's target, but we were going to try and advocate for many individuals 
to look at their giving profile. And we launched a campaign at the World Economic Forum at the start of this year called the Give While You Live campaign, led by a number of billionaires, the world's wealthiest people, um, to really make this pledge this year and commit to the global goals because we know within countries, you know, that there's great tax incentives in the US to give in those countries, but we also want to see them targeted to the developing world and to delivering the end poverty agenda. So uh, we did, we have commenced that outreach. That's, that's a key priority of our campaigning um, through One World Together at Home and Global Goal Unite, the two COVID broadcast events we were able to secure hundreds of millions of dollars of commitments from individuals and corporates to that in COVID-19 campaigning. But we know that the roadmap for ending extreme poverty, if, if the world's wealthiest gave just a, you know, even 5% of their wealth to these causes, we could see an end to extreme poverty and, and these projects funded. But it's you know uh, it's, a, it's a complex campaign and and there's been strong leadership by individuals like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. But you know there's a lot to do and, and their leadership will be critical in that. It's funny, isn't it, how compassion and and generosity can um, do do so much. Um, I might, uh, as you can probably see from the chat uh, session, there's so many questions. Um, <laughs> I might uh, I might throw to Chris Stillwell. Um, who uh, has a question that's not dissimilar to one from, from Renata Bernard around the, the, the money and how it's distributed. So, Chris, would you like to put your question to Sarah? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Michaela. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, your presentation. Uh, my question is a fairly basic question, and if I missed it in your presentation, I apologise. Is Global Citizen a fundraiser in its own right, or is it really an adv advocacy group encouraging others to donate to specific specific causes yeah it's, it's you, you've got the right assessment so um what we do is put poverty on the gender and have a platform so when we do a concert we have we break the show into segments into issue areas so for example the environment was an issue area last year and we called on companies to make bold commitments towards changing their uh, their product line and um you know, recycling initiatives and, and making better sustainability choices. But we also um, ask companies and individuals and governments to make commitments to health and gender equality and zero hunger and the no poverty agenda. And how we do that is we say, for example, we partner with the Global Polio Eradication Initiative and we say to a government or a corporate, this initiative is delivering the vaccines on the ground they are a, an organisation you can trust and work with, make a bold commitment to get this program funding in the next 12 months and we will give you a place on the stage and work with you on an advocacy campaign around that. We've got time for one, one more question. I might um, ask Cheryl Lacey, who um, has, has uh, put a question up. Are, are you there, Cheryl? Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, thank you. Uh, I did have a couple of questions, but I might just ask the question um, regarding uh, education. And uh, if education is key, you mentioned that uh, being key to many of these issues that these countries are facing, what sort of benchmarks do you have in place to know that you've actually met uh, the requirement with your organisation regarding education so that you can hand over responsibility to that um, learning that's been acquired to the host country? So in that context, so for us, the, the measurement of whether Global Goal 4 quality education has been delivered is the UN Sustainable Development Goal targets, which is tracked and measured. But we do partner with a couple of organisations. So we have partnered um, with the Global Partnership for Education that provides schooling across the globe. That program, um, we work with that partner to report accountability and then sync up donors to that program. In terms of another uh, organisation we work with is UNICEF Globally and the Education Cannot Wait Fund, which provides education for children in emergencies. Um, so that's all children in refugee camps, making sure they receive the critical education in crisis. Um, I think for us, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult problem 
to face. How do we ensure that every child receives an education and it's the type of education that can help lift them out of poverty? There are a number of benchmarks. The Global uh, Partnership for Education speaks to that, but also the goals and the metrics within the global goals speaks to that as well. Um, I think for me personally, it's the most exciting and important uh, program area to receive uh, to receive funding. We know if you educate a girl, you change the world. And it, an educated girl will um, pass on that uh, that outcome, that benefit to her family um, and will also make different choices about her life and her um, future career or her future pathways in whichever country she's in. So I think um, for us, education is going to be a critical um, focus point, a critical ask in the next decade. Thank you. So one, one last question. So one last question before we close. Um, uh, Jim Orchard was asking um, around a definition of, of poverty. So uh, Jim, did you want to um, take the floor? Sure, I was just, um, maybe just a fairly basic question, but you're talking about extreme poverty. So what, what is that in perhaps US dollars per day or year? So the, the global definition is less than $1.90 US dollars a day and so that's what we benchmark it on but there's a lot of commentary at the moment in looking at that dollar figure and there's some great content that i'm happy to share you know there's um there was a, a recent article talking about whether it should be five dollars fifty usd but what we measure is the the real extreme poverty of one dollar ninety a day um, but we know that poverty looks different in many countries and and we do need to be fighting for equality and justice for all across a number of countries. And so we do sometimes, you know, for in, in Australia particularly, we do really touch on Indigenous Australians and some of the health challenges in our own country. Um, and we know that that's not the true definition of extreme poverty, but we, we, we still talk about broader poverty and the global goals. Wow. Thank you. I tell you what, well, we might wind up um, and perhaps I might be um, old enough to uh, finish with a comment. Um, the thing that strikes me, Sarah, is um, not only the quality of the performers and others that are with you that are lending their brand to your brand, but also the companies that you've got listed as your um, connectors. I mean, that's a really impressive, um, you know, cohort, a stable, if you will, of people who support your cause. Um, so, um, congratulations. I think it's absolutely extraordinary.